Welcome to another episode of What's Working in E-Commerce. I'm your host, Egan Heath from Caravan Digital. We're a digital marketing agency for e-commerce brands. Today, I'm excited to be speaking with Kathleen Booth from Tradeswell. Kathleen, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do in e-commerce? Yeah. Hey, Egan. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, as you said, Kathleen Booth, I'm Senior Vice President of Marketing at Tradeswell, which uh, we make an e-commerce operating system, which basically means that we have a platform that helps e-commerce brands pull all their data in from their different sales, retail, marketplace, marketing channels, and we combine that with logistics and inventory data to basically give them a single source of truth for how their business and their products are performing across all of their channels without having to deal with the spreadsheet madness. I see. Yeah. So in some cases, do your customers or clients, then they have, do they have brick and mortar and e-commerce? Some of them do. And we, we don't currently pull in brick and mortar data, but um, yes, we were integrated with Shopify, big commerce, Amazon, Target, Walmart, Ulta Beauty, Facebook, Google, Klaviyo, TikTok, you name it. <laughs> Most of the digital channels. Yeah. Yeah. So client, the clients may be selling on Walmart, Amazon, direct consumer through Shopify, and you're putting all the data together then. Yeah. We're putting it all together and we're normalizing at the SKU level. So you can see like where your widget is performing across all your channels in like one view. So it's apples to apples. And instead of what normally they deal with is very much apples to oranges. Well, I understand, you know, you've got a lot of, you've seen, you've got a lot of breadth. You've seen a lot in e-commerce. I wanted to start with a little bit about ROAS. Of wh why is ROAS not the right metric for e-commerce brands to be looking at? Yeah, this this maybe this will be a little controversial. Um, I mean, I'm a marketer. I owned an agency for 11 years, um, and I feel like all the marketers I know and all the agencies I know, they're, they tend to report on ROAS, and it's a convenient metric because. It is fully within the control of the marketer to report on, so that's nice. You don't need anybody else to help you or to give you data, et cetera. Um, but the issue with ROAS is that it speaks to top line results, which is revenue. And that's only a part of the story. And I think particularly at a time like now when we're in a lot of economic uncertainty, there's a lot of pressure on brands, we cannot just report on top line metrics. We really have to be focused on not just growth, but profitable growth. And to do that, you I'm not saying don't look at ROAS, but I'm saying look at ROAS, but also, you have to look at net margin contribution. You need to know how the sales of your product and how your advertising driven sales are contributing to bottom line metrics. I've heard people talk about net margin contribution on other podcasts. You're the first person to bring it up on what's working in e-commerce. So I'm really glad for that. Can you define us, define that for us and walk us through it? Oh boy, okay. I've never expressed it as an exact formula, but here's the way I would describe it is, you know, with ROAS, you're really looking on how much you spent on advertising against how much revenue those ad the those ads drove. And it, with net margin contribution, you're really looking at how much you spent on advertising versus how much net margin, meaning meaning profit after landed costs that those ads drove. And so Really what that speaks to is you could be driving top line sales and revenue by advertising a particular product, but if that product is very low margin, when you take out all of your platform fees and your other costs, you really might not be making much, if any, money, or you could be losing money. I mean, there certainly are loss leaders, and sometimes there are good reasons to invest in promoting them if they, for example, if they're a great first purchase for a high LTV customer, but you really need to understand what that the advertising spend is doing to contribute to the bottom line. And here's where it gets tricky is you need to do it at a product or a category level, not just an aggregate. And that's complicated, right? Because particularly if you're a multi-channel seller who's on Shopify, who's on Amazon, you know, who might be in a, in a retail site, you need to be able to understand how your ads are, are contributing to the performance of that product and to net margin across all those different channels. Is it profitable? Not not just what does the ROAS look like? Are we getting a return based on you know ad spend and top line, but also what are your margins on those products? When you say that, are we talking about variable costs? That's based on you know when we sell a product, here was our cost of goods sold, or when we're saying net contribution margin, are we getting to even bottom line, true bottom line profit? How much is marketing contributing to that? True bottom line profit because you know you 
you should be looking at your cost of goods sold. And this, by the way, this is why this is tricky and why I think a lot of marketers and people in, in the e-commerce world talk about this, but very few have done it. And the reason is that structurally there's a disincentive to do it because the marketer who controls the ad spend does not always have access to the cost of goods sold or even better, the landed cost data. And so to answer your question, yes, you need the cost of goods sold information at the product or the, you know, the slash the SKU level, if you will. But you also really need your landed costs. So if you're selling on platforms like Amazon, it's not just your, you know, your pure cost of goods sold. There's other fees associated with selling on these different platforms. And you need to factor that all in to the picture so that you can really understand profit at the end of the day. Yeah, that's fascinating. So landed cost was the other one I wanted to ask you about. That's that's taking into account fixed costs as well, or that's still variable cost that happens when you sell a product? It's both. So if we have a client, for example, where they, for whatever reason, they're doing it out of their own warehouse, they're fulfilling on their own, their flat sort of monthly warehouse costs, do those figure into landed costs? <music> Yeah, I mean, really, it's your entire cost of getting that product to the customer. That's your landed cost. And so it's your warehousing fees. It's your your materials costs. It's, you know, as, as I said, if you're selling through a platform like an Amazon, even if you're fulfilling on your own, it's any platform fees that you're incurring by selling there. Um, so there's it's, it's complicated, right? There's a lot of factors that go into uh, determining what those costs are. In terms of breaking that down and getting it at a product level, you know, can you tell us a little bit about how you guys do that or you know, what you've seen as successful to get to that level of reporting of here's the advertising. I don't know if it is at this level of here's the advertising spend on a particular product. Here was the you know, net profit contribution margin. You know, how, how do you get there? Yeah, so there's a couple different ways to tackle this. And I think the first, it really starts with like breaking down internal silos within your organization as an e-commerce brand. Um, and so, like I said earlier, very often the, the folks in charge of marketing and advertising don't necessarily have detailed cost data or, or numbers to put into their models. And so that's the first thing. It's, it's, it's getting aligned and, and, and getting buy-in for the notion that marketing needs transparency and visibility into finance information. Um, now, that could be complicated. Not every organization is built to support that. And so I think there's like degrees here. The, the ultimate objective would be to have accurate information for each product on what the true landed costs are of that product. If you can't get that, then the next best solution is to have sort of an, an across the board estimate that's at least getting you closer. So like if you know, for example, that 30% is a good estimate for, for full landed costs across the board, that's better than nothing, right? That's better than, than just using ROAS. And so, you know, it, it, there's a little bit of an evolution to getting there. Um, you can certainly do it through spreadsheets and manual calculations. I mean, we've obviously built a platform to try to automate all this for you, um, but you don't have to have a platform. I'm not on here to say that. Um, well, I would love if everyone bought Tradeswell. This is something that you can do without a software solution. Got it. It can be complicated. It can be a lot of spreadsheet work, and that's kind of what you guys make easier. That makes sense. Yeah, exactly. When people get onboarded then with Tradeswell, is it are there particular questions that the software asks or that you guys ask to understand those costs? Do you need to, you know, plug into something like QuickBooks? You know, how do you get that data and stitch it together? When you get Tradeswell, the first thing that happens is you integrate all your data sources and um, we're always adding new integrations. Our goal is to eventually cover everything that a brand would possibly need, but they're they're pretty quick. They're, they're all native integrations. You hit a button, it pulls in your data. It takes could take up to 24 hours, but usually it's faster than that. And it populates two years historic data. So you get all your data in the platform. And then we have an AI that actually maps your products across channels, because this is the complicated part. Like your, your SKU on Amazon, they call it an ASIN, is not the same as your SKU on Shopify, is not the same as the one on Walmart, et cetera. So the first thing that, that our system does is it actually figures out, oh, this widget 
is that ASIN and that SKU, et cetera. And it brings all the data in and creates almost like a master SKU. So in some ways it's like a PIM, but we're not creating a PIM for content management. We're creating it really for, for data and insights management. So our product graph, as we call it, builds that product catalog on the back end that is cross-channel. And then you will really, you'll go in and you'll either say, for example, that 30% swag, I think our platform defaults to 30%. So if you don't know what your product by product cost of goods sold is, you can choose to put a, a blanket percentage there, or you can do different percentages by categories, however you want to do it. Or you can work with your finance team and they can go in and add the landed costs for every individual product. It's really up to you. At that point, you're in control. Um, but once that's in there, we're able to give you a wealth of information and insights on how the product is performing. That's awesome. And have you guys run into challenges with iOS 14 and, you know, Facebook's reporting in terms of being able to close the loop on Facebook spend was over here, sales of this particular product were over here. How do we attribute the sales to which channel, you know, to which advertising channel? Yeah, I mean, I haven't heard that we've had a lot of problems with that. Um, you know, obviously we're constrained by the data that Facebook gives us. Um, but so far, I think we've been able to build a pretty robust model that, um, that is accurate enough to, to give really meaningful insights and actionable insights. I think that's the big thing. It's every, every e-commerce marketer I talk to is like, I, I honestly don't want more data. Like that's just going to make me stressed out. What I really want to know is what to do with it. And so that's what we're focused on is telling them what to do. So we, we surface actionable insights. We down to things like, Hey, increase your bid price here, or maybe stop advertising this product. Cause you're going to run out of inventory, those sorts of things. This is really apropos Kathleen. I think we're seeing this more and more that even as marketing consultants, we're having to dig deeper and deeper into the finance side. And so I think, you, you know, I've, I've sort of seen you talk about there's kind of a disconnect of we've got the marketers, we've got the finance people, and you guys are bringing that together. You know, how did how did you discover this need or how did you guys see this? And it's, I'd just like to hear you talk about that a little bit. It sounds like we're kind of marrying those worlds of CMO and CFO type jobs. Yeah, and I'll start by saying that like that actually – can sound really scary <laughs> as to a marketer. I'm a marketer. And if you told me, oh, your CFO is going to be in your advertising data, I'd be like, oh, forget it. I don't want her in there. <laughs> you know, I don't want her second guessing every ad campaign spend I do. That's not the intention of this. Um, and, and we want marketers to own their marketing decisions and to be empowered for it. And so what really kind of inspired this was uh, several members of our founding team came out of the agency world, and they were managing massive ad spend budgets for many, many e-commerce brands and really struggling to report accurately on performance across channels for exactly the reasons we've talked about. And so the platform was originally built to, to scratch an itch that they already had. It was like, how can we automate this? Like, we shouldn't be dealing with all these spreadsheets every week or month or whatever when we need to report to customers. And so they built it to solve for that. But that was like, that was like the canary in the coal mine. I think as soon as we started building the platform, we began to see the deeper problems here. And so, you know, for example, as a marketer also who has a, a decent paid ad but paid ads budget, you know, what I've seen across my career is very often as a head of marketing, you're told this is how much you can spend on paid ads, right? Like it's X amount per month. And the reason that CFOs come to us and tell us this is how much you have is because we're reporting on things like ROAS, right? And not it's, it's because we're not telling them, here's how much profit I'm generating. CFOs get ROAS, but it's not really meaningful to them. Whereas if I went to my CFO and I said, hey, for every dollar I spend in ads, I can drive, you know, $3 in bottom line profit, then what happens with that is the dynamic completely changes and the conversation changes and it's no longer you have X amount to spend per month. It's you have an unlimited amount to spend per month because I know that if I put $1 into the advertising budget, I'm going to get $3 back at the end of the day. So that totally changes the game for marketers. Yeah, that's a great description of that. Of We, don't, we no longer have a fixed budget as long as there's net ROI that we can prove and we know you know, spend a dollar and get more than a dollar back, that's profitable. 
Yeah, and it's not ROI as we define it as marketers, and that's why ROAS has been problematic because we've been defining it that way because it's convenient for us. You have to define ROI as the CFO defines it, and they define it honestly in profit terms, not in top line revenue terms. This might be a good time to ask about what is real time commerce, and you know how does that connect with e commerce brands? Sure. So. We've we talk a lot about real time commerce at Tradeswell, and it's because when you look at what's been happening in the last several years, there's this massive explosion of channels available to e-commerce brands, and it's it's phenomenal, right? There's there's limit a limitless opportunity, and we've mentioned so many of those channels here today, um, Amazon and Target and Walmart, so marketplaces and retail channels, and D 2 C is exploding, and then on the marketing and advertising side, there's a lot of channels as well, you know, Facebook and Google, and now everybody's hot on TikTok. Um, So many of these channels present tremendous opportunity, but they're also very complex and challenging because they're really algorithmic at the end of the day. All of the the channels I just referenced, maybe minus D to C because you're in control, um, are driven by algorithms. And so the products that show up are the ones that are optimized best for the algorithm. And the algorithms change all of the time. And they're not always, those changes are not always published. Um, And so real-time commerce is really just an an acknowledgement that to succeed in today's world of e-commerce, you as a brand have to be moving and optimizing either at the same speed or faster than the speed of the algorithms of the channels that you're advertising and selling on because whoever can do that is the one that's going to win, right? And so you have to optimize your business to move that quickly. How big should a brand be? You know, what kind of sales should they be doing? How many SKUs should they have, you know, to, to consider, you know, a tool like Tradeswell? Oh, gosh. I mean, you can be quite small. Um, you know, for, in terms of from a price point standpoint, our lowest plan starts at $99 a month. So it's really accessible for anybody, I would say, um, you know, but I think it, it just depends on the type of business you're in because we have some customers that sell really high dollar value items and not a lot of them, but it, there's a lot at, at stake because of that. <laughs> and so they need really good information. And then we have other, like we have the single largest seller account on Amazon as a customer. Just, I don't even know how many SKUs, probably I couldn't count. Um, and so for them, it's it's extremely important to have really good system to pull that data in and quickly surface those insights. Otherwise they'd get bogged down in analysis and analysis paralysis really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is the danger, Kathleen, if brands are not looking at this sort of data, you know, across their channels? I I feel like the biggest thing is time, right? Like that's the one commodity that, that we don't, we can't get more of. There are only 24 hours in the day. And I've, I've heard this with every marketer I've ever spoken to, but I think also every business owner, we're all plagued with not enough time. And when when we talk to customers, the ones who are solving this manually through spreadsheets, some of them have said they spend up to a day a week combing through the data, trying to rationalize it and figure out what to do with it. So if you actually think you could save a day a week that you were otherwise pouring into this type of analysis, Imagine what you could do if that time were given back to you. You know, you could pour it into product innovation. There, there, there are an infinite number of ways you could use it, but the productivity of your team would grow up dramatically and your speed to action would also increase, which speaks to that real-time commerce challenge of moving as fast as the algorithms. And so there's tremendous potential if you're able to harness it. And it sounds like one of those key metrics people are digging in and spending a day on is that's Something like profit per product, is that right? Oh, it's that. And it's just also even like ba- more basic than that, understanding like where should I be putting my ad dollars next? Because rationalizing the performance across channels, like if I'm promoting this product, should I be promoting it more on Shopify or on, you know, Target? or on Amazon, what's gonna yield the best results? And am I getting better results from my Facebook campaigns, my TikTok campaigns, my Google campaigns? Like there's just so many variables. 
and figuring out where to spend that next dollar so that it's going to generate the most amount of profit for you is a really complicated question. It's so much more complicated than it should be. Right. And if you're just going on ROAS, you may not be going, it, that may be counter to your actual net contribution margin. Where is the best place to put your ad dollars? Yeah, it's a feel good metric. It's it's like I said, it's easy. We lean on it because it's it's easy to calculate. We don't need to call the CFO for data and we can quickly make decisions on it, but it's not what's really going to drive performance at the end of the day. And in, and I said this earlier, but I just want to underscore it. You know, we're living at a time of tremendous economic uncertainty, especially with events happening overseas, political turmoil. Nobody knows what's going to happen with the economy, and this is the time right now if you're a brand to be focused on net margin contribution, if you're an agency, absolutely to be focused on this because I owned an agency for 11 years through the 20, 2008, 2010 recession. And I know firsthand, the first thing to be cut is the agency spend, right? Everybody's like, oh, I can in-house this and save money. But if you are an agency and you can demonstrate how you're contributing to profit, you make yourself indispensable. So on all fronts, this this needs to be the focus now more than ever, I think. That's great. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Anything else I should have asked you about or that you want to share? So we did a bunch of research last year. Um, I, I think I mentioned where we asked e-commerce leaders about what their biggest challenges were. And three themes really emerged from that research. And, and I think these three themes are, are the keys to success for any brand. And it's data unification, alignment, and speed. And I've kind of like alluded to them, but I just want to call those three out. If you can solve for these three things as a brand, if you can really see your data all in one place and have that single source of truth, if you can get your team aligned around looking at the same information for critical decision making, and if you can use that data in a way that powers very fast decision making, those three things taken together should set you up for success, even in the most challenging of times. Well put. That's great. Kathleen, thank you so much for sharing what's working in e-commerce. Who's a good fit for you guys and where can they find you? Um, really, I think anybody that's using any of the platforms we integrate with, which I think I mentioned on the D2C side is Shopify and BigCommerce. And on the marketplace side, it's Amazon, Walmart, Target, and Ulta Beauty. Um, any combination of those is a great fit for us. And you can find us at tradeswell.com. Thank you so much, Kathleen. My pleasure, Egan. Thanks for having me. 